Hi everyone, thank you so much for attending the session. Today I'm going to talk about API security and the OSP top 10 for APIs. In the second part of the presentation, I will uh, give it to Anoop and they will talk about the traceable product and give you a quick demo of the product. Uh, the agenda in a high level is to talk a little bit about uh, modern application security because API security is uh, technically just one aspect of modern application security. And we're going to compare it with traditional application security. We're going to see what are the big changes that happened in the last few years in the field of application security. We're going to talk about the biggest challenge of APIs, which is the authorization challenge. And then we're going to uh, take a look at the OSP top 10 for APIs. We'll see a few uh, real world examples, a few breaches that happened in large companies in the last few years. So just a quick background about myself. Uh, I'm Inum Shkedi. I'm the head of security research at Traceable AI. Uh, and I grew up with APIs. So what does it mean? Basically, uh, I started my career. I used to be uh, back, back in Israel. I used to be part of the red team of the Israeli army. And I performed pen tests to uh, more traditional applications, like in, in the field of government, military, and financial. And as you can imagine, those systems are heavily based on traditional technologies. I saw a lot of Java, ASP.NET, and SAP. And very old concepts like multi-page applications, on-prem environments, waterfall, uh, and APIs used to be just a niche component, mostly for B2B communication. After five years serving in the, in the Israeli army, I decided to move to the Silicon Valley in California. And in the last uh, five years, in the last four years, I've been working mostly with startups and T1 companies, and I got exposed to a new field of, of technologies. Node.js, Elixir, Ruby on Rails, and started seeing many modern concepts like single page applications, cloud environment, CICD. And the most important part, all these technologies are driven by APIs. So APIs are not longer just a niche component, they became the backbone of the application. Um, and you know, after I moved, I, I started seeing those new technologies and I kind of figured out that uh, it's not the same attack surface. If I wanted to stay relevant in the field and to be able to hack APIs, I had to adapt myself to this new environment. Uh, so this is why I started the OSP API, uh, OSP top 10 for APIs. Um, so I want to talk about what's changed in the field of uh, application security. One second. Sorry. Uh, I want to talk about what changed in the field of application security. And just to start with the, the change in the traffic patterns between the client, the server, and the databases. So back in the day, if we talk about traditional applications, the, the, the pattern used to be pretty simple. The client would send a single HTTP request to the web server, for example, give me a home.jsp, which is just an HTML page. Uh, the web server would uh, fetch data from database, usually just the SQL database and basically start the process of rendering of the HTML page, it will be sent back to the client. So this process of sending, uh, of sending like a visual page to the client is called rendering, and it was done on the server side. And the client would simply present this HTML uh, to the user, I mean the browser. Today it looks very different. Today clients know much better what they need. Today, like your clients, if we talk about, for example, the, um, the Facebook application, they know much better uh, what they need from the API, not just give me a whole web page. They would ask, they would ask the API for specific uh, pieces of information. For example, I want to see the last 10 comments from my post. I want to see the list of my friends using this and these filters. Uh, so the clients send these API calls to the API and the API in some way is used as a, a proxy between the client and the database. The API would fetch data from a database and return to the user uh, the data in a raw format of JSON. So APIs don't really know what is uh, HTML. They just return JSONs, uh, like raw data in the format of JSON to the client. And the rendering process is done on the client side, which is a very big uh, change and it has impacts on security. And we're gonna talk, talk about them in a few slides. Uh, a few other changes that happens in modern applications. First of all, if we talk about the client, you have many types of clients. On top of the uh, browsers, you also can find IoT devices, you can find mobile devices, and even other engineers, other developers that use our APIs to develop their own APIs or applications. Uh, and the second point, which is a kind of an interesting point, APIs expose less abstraction layers. 
If you take a look at the traffic between the client and the API, you can understand what happens behind the scenes in the application. Uh, if we compare it to like the more traditional type of application, if uh, if you take a look at like you know a request, one second. Sorry, there was an alarm. Um, so basically, clients, servers, and databases speak the same language of JSON. So uh, J the JSON format that is passed by a client, uh, by, for example, the Uber application, might be the same JSON that is passed by the API. There are much less abstraction there, it makes it much easier for the attacker to take a look at the traffic and to understand how the API works, how the application works behind the scenes. And just a few words about DevOps. So there is good news and bad news. Let's start with the good news. Uh, one good thing that happened because of the cloud providers is that classic IT issues like open pods and old versions barely exist today, uh, thanks to uh, to the cloud providers. Today, it's, it's really hard to like, for example, to open unnecessary pods for your application. Uh, the like AWS console would show you like a bunch of uh, of uh, alerts. Uh, and the bad news, it's it makes it much harder to keep on track with APIs. Uh, it makes it almost too easy to spin up a new a new API. You know, today like every developer, every DevOps engineer in the company can spin up a new a new API host, a new service in seconds, which makes it much more challenging to keep on track with all of them, which leads to the problem of shadow APIs. If we talk about purely application security, many of the traditional application security problems don't really exist in modern applications. And let's let's review some of them. So if we talk about SQL injection, that used to be the most critical uh, application security vulnerability, today is mostly solved because developers use ORM environments instead of native SQL. By the way, developers don't use it because it's more secure, just because it's more convenient, it's, it's much easier to use it. Uh, if we talk about cross-site scripting, Today, the clients are responsible to protect against uh, cross-site scripting. I mean, if the, if the API returns uh, uh, JSON, and not HTML, there is no chance that the server, that, like the server can, can protect you from the, from the cross-site scripting. This is something that should be done locally on the client. If you talk about XXC, which is a vulnerability in the passing process of XML, today it's solved just because developers choose to use JSONs. Um, but there is also bad news. First of all, the attack surface is much larger. APIs expose more endpoints, and the, in each one of these endpoints exposes more parameters. And you know, as a pen tester, as an, as a, as an attacker, uh, basically every parameter that the application exposes, and you can send like every input that you can send from the client to the application, it's another attack, attack potential attack surface, like another place to that you can try potentially to inject something or to uh, put some malicious input. The second point is that APIs are oversharing. Uh, APIs many times expose too much information. And like as a, as a pen tester, you can just take a look at the traffic and uh, see very interesting information about the application. And the third point is that APIs are much more predictable. The nature of the REST standard is to encourage developer to uh, develop APIs in a very generic way. So it would be much easier to use them for like other developers, from the front end engineer developers it's much easier to use those APIs, but at the same time, it makes it also much easier for attackers to understand uh, those APIs. So all these changes led me uh, to join RSA Alone from Checkmarks and start the OWASP API project and, and define the top 10 threats for APIs. Uh, I wanna talk about the list of the OWASP top 10 for APIs, but before I wanna talk about the biggest challenge when it comes to APIs the access control or authorization challenge. So if we take a look at the recent breaches that happened in the last, you know, last few months, we can see that many of them are related to authorization problems. And it took me some time to understand like why authorization became such a big issue, why it, why it became the most critical issue in APIs. So I think there are two potential answers that I believe uh, these are the right answers. The first one is that authorization, it's a very decentralized mechanism. If we think about other security mechanisms, for example, authentication. Authentication usually uh, authentication is usually done in one or two components in the in the code or in the system. But when it comes to authorization, it's a very decentralized and spread out mechanism. If you talk about function level authorization, it's basically the the uh, the process of validating that the user can access only functions that they should be able to access. And for example, that one user cannot access admin functions. 
Uh, this type of authorization is done in the code, in the configuration, and sometimes even in the API gateway. If we talk about object level authorization, which is the process of validating that one user uh, has access to the object that he has requested, it's done in the code and it's done in many, many places. Almost every controller, uh, basically every controller that receives an ID from the client uh, needs to perform authorization check. So it's much harder to, to apply a good authorization mechanism just because it has so many legs. The second point is that uh, modern applications today, they tend to be very complex in terms of uh, the users, the roles, and the hierarchies between them. So you can see that uh, modern applications have many types of users. And sometimes they even have, like each user has like a sub user. For example, if you, if you log into your uh, health provider, you might be able to create a, a, a sub account for your, like, uh, for your kids, uh, which makes it, in terms of authorization, basically it makes it like that you have like one user that has another sub user. It makes it much more challenging to, uh, to create policies and to follow the best practices when the authorization system becomes uh, more complex. So let's talk about the first API issue. It's called the, the top one API issue as part of the OSP top 10 for APIs, uh, which is called BOLA, Broken Object Level Authorization. You might know this problem as uh, IDOR, Insecure Direct Object Reference, but we decided to change the name to BOLA. Uh, so basically what happens in BOLA, it's a situation in the API that one user can, hack, can access uh, an object that doesn't belong to him. So let's see how it looks like. So if you, if you take a ride on a, some ride sharing app, you can see here on the left side. And after you take the ride, you want to rate the driver as five stars. Basically, uh, after you click the five stars and share with the Lyft, uh, the API, your mobile client would generate an API call to post slash rate trip, right? Uh, but the problem is that you didn't take only one trip in your uh, in in in, uh, in this ride sharing application. You took many many different trips in the past, so your client has to mention which trip ID you want to update. This is the number you can see here. Uh, so this is this is okay. This is the design of, of REST APIs. But what happens uh, in in the case of of Bola is that the developers don't actually validate that this specific user has access to this specific trip. And then they just update the, the trip based on the input from the user. Uh, and basically, if I was an attacker, I could change the trip ID to something else and to edit a trip of someone else. Uh, in this case, for example, I could uh, rate all the trips on Uber. I could write a script to enumerate all the numbers and to rate all the trips as zero. Bola can also lead to much more critical stuff. And we're gonna, talk about, we're gonna see one example that actually happened on the Uber app. This uh, vulnerability was found by Anand Prakash from App Secure, and it's uh, a ball of vulnerability that led to full account takeover on Uber. Basically, the attacker found a way to get full access to all the, uh, the riders' accounts and the drivers' accounts on Uber. So the vulnerable API was get consent screen details. And as you can see here on the left side, the request contained the user ID. Of, of, uh, of yourself. If you're a legit, a legit user, you just send the ID of yourself and the response contains details about your user, including the authentication token, which is very interesting. So what Anand tried to do is just to change the ID of his own user to an ID of someone else. And he managed to take uh, details of other users, including their authentication tokens. And this is how you can uh, leverage Wallet to, to gain full account takeover. Let's jump to number three, excessive data exposure. So this is a very common vulnerability in APIs. And what happens in, in this vulnerability is that the API exposes sensitive information that you're not supposed to be able to access uh, by design. You just take a look at the traffic and, uh, and you just see information that you're not supposed to see. It's kind of weird, but let's see how it looks behind the scenes. So for example, you have this dating app and you see the profile of Bob. Uh, you just swiping right and left, and then you see the, the profile of Bob, and you see only the profile picture, the name, and the hobbies, which all of them is public information that you're, you're supposed to be able to, to see. But behind the scenes, if we take a look at the traffic between the client and the API, you can see that the, the client will generate an API call to get slash users slash 717, which is the ID of Bob. And the response from the API contains a JSON uh, with all the public details, but also if you take a look here, you can see that it contains the address of Bob, which is PII, it's sensitive information. 
that shouldn't be exposed to the client. Uh, so what happens is that the developers on the back end, they rely on the developers in the front end to filter out this data. And they actually do it. You can see the address of the, of the screen of the app, but it's not, it doesn't matter. Like if you're an attacker, you can simply sniff the traffic and see the send information. So basically filtering uh, information that is sensitive on the client side is always a bad idea. And it happens a lot in APIs. Uh, this is an example from an app that's called the uh, TreeFund, basically an application, a uh, mobile app for couples that are willing to add someone to the relationship. Uh, and the researcher, Alex Thomas, was trying to see if he can find an interesting API vulnerabilities on this API. So basically what happens when you start using the app, uh, your, broad, your client would generate an API call to match users, to look for users around your area. And the response contains a list of users uh, that are in your area and are willing to, that are also using the app. Uh, so what the researcher found is that uh, the response contains all the public information, but also the, the specific location of the user and also private photos that the user uh, was sending to specific users and they are not public. But this was a very big breach. And the next thing that Alex did, uh, it was kind of interesting to see, he mapped all the users of TreeFan around the White House in Washington, DC. Uh, so this is pretty interesting uh, information. Let's jump into Buffla, broken function level authorization. This is a vulnerability that happens when an API has sub APIs. What does it mean? Think about uh, an application that, like, like Uber, again, uh, that has different types of users. You have admin API and you have riders APIs that should be accessed only by riders. Then you have the driver's API. And then there is an admin who is using the, uh, the admin console uh, of Uber, and he's trying to delete a specific user. So behind the scenes, his browser would send an API call to the admin API to delete a specific user, delete user uh, slash 717, which is legit, right? Because admins should be able to delete different users. It's part of the functionality of the app. Uh, but what happens if an attacker that has a simple like guest account or just a writer account sends the same exact API call to delete the same user? What happens many times in the case of uh, APIs is that the developers don't really validate that the user, that the end user actually belongs to the group. Uh, and this is how you could, as a, as a guest user or like a weak user to access admin, uh, admin functions. A recent example for Buffla in uh, Shopify, uh, it was part of uh, Hacker One bug bounty. The, the bug bounty hunter won 20K because of this vulnerability. Basically found um, an admin API endpoint on Shopify that allows him to define himself as a collaborator. What is a collaborator? It's basically a shop admin. If you're a collaborator on Shopify, you, you will have full access to make any changes on the, on the shop. So he found an admin endpoint that allowed himself to escalate the privileges of himself and to be an admin, which is very interesting. Let's talk about uh, mass assignment. This is a, a very tricky API vulnerability. And I think this is one of the uh, most complex to, to explain and understand. So in order to understand what is mass assignment, I want to explain uh, what was before mass assignment. What is a code that is not vulnerable to mass assignment? Oh, sorry. So I'm sorry, I don't have the slide. But basically, let's talk about uh, how mass assignment function, uh, like how mass assignment vulnerable function looks in, a, in a Ruby on Rails. So basically, there is an API call to create a user. And you can see that the developer took each one of the parameters from the request and put them inside a, like local variables on the, on the code, like first name, last name, and password, and save this object. This is the, 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 code on the, the code on the left is not vulnerable to mass assignment. Uh, at the same time, the code on the right is vulnerable to mass assignment because in this case, on, in, the, in the code on the right, this is Ruby on Rails. Basically, the developer takes the JSON object from the browser of the client or from the mobile app and just save the, uh, the object as is. It's very convenient from like, the developer perspective because they don't need to write so much code. Look like how instead of like a five line of code, it's only one line of code. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, it's very common in modern application to use mass assignment, but it also opens the door for something that's called mass assignment vulnerability. Uh, it basically allows you as an attacker to edit 
properties of the object that you're not supposed to access. For example, if we talk, uh, take a look at this uh, create new user uh, API endpoint, so legit call would look like username in on, password one to six, and then the malicious API call would contain these sp uh, special parameters called role, and I will try to define myself in, as an admin. If the, if the developers don't implement mass assignment protection and they use this approach, basically the API would take this JSON that you, you see here as it is and save it in a database, and then I would, I would create myself an admin account. A recent example uh, from a New Relic, the researcher James Kettle from Portswigger found a way to, uh, to enable premium API access using mass assignment without paying for it. So he found an API endpoint that allows you to, uh, to update your profile information, things like first name and last name. Then he just added uh, a new field, allow API access equals true. And then the API of New Relic just took this uh, this parameter and uh, assigned it uh, to the user. So it basically managed to get a premium API access without paying for it. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about injections. So injections used to be the most common vulnerability in application security for many years. If you take a look at uh, all of the OSP API lists, they are always like uh, one of the no like one of the two uh, first vulnerabilities. Many questions. Many people ask me this question: Why did you move injections from A1 to A8 to A8 to the bottom of the list? So I would say, ask yourself first why injection used to be number one as part of this uh, of those lists. And the main reason is SQL injection. It's true that there are many other types of injections that are you, you can find, like um, for example, shell injections and stuff like that. But they are much less common than SQL injection. SQL injection, this is the vulnerability that made injections such a big issue. Um, basically, 10 years ago, if you knew how to exploit SQL injection, you, you could uh, exploit almost any website on the web. Um, but today, uh, you know, SQL injections have been around for many, many years, I think almost 20 years. Uh, and with time, they became much less common. Today, in modern applications, if we're talking about applications that were written in the last five years, it will be hard for you as a pen tester to find the SQL injection because of a few different reasons. The first one is we said the use of OORM environments that uh, solve SQL injection by design, or at least most of them. Uh, the second point is that so many security products that solve SQL injection, uh, at some point it, they started to catch up. And also the use of NoSQL. Uh, NoSQL injections are still a thing, but they're usually much less severe and common. I want to talk about uh, uh, vulnerability number nine improper asset management. Basically, um, this is not the sexiest vulnerability, but it's some type of like a housekeeping vulnerability. It happens when developers or the companies are not aware of all of their APIs and API endpoints. So let's see how it looks like. Um, on the left side, this is the first type of, of uh, improper asset management. It's basically that you have API endpoints that have no documentation. So, for example, you have an API that exposes three different endpoints, the get user, update location, and export all users. And the developers who wrote the APIs documented only two of those. And then you have like one endpoint, the export all users under the P2P old API, that nobody knows what is the purpose of this uh, API endpoint. And uh, they, like, they, they probably don't know that it's even exposed to the internet just because there is no documentation for that. So this, this aspect is the responsibility of the developers to document every API endpoint that they expose to, uh, to clients. It's very important. Uh, and then the second aspect of um, improper asset management is that sometimes you have unknown API hosts and sometimes even complete environments that the companies don't know what is their purpose. Uh, many times when I perform like, uh, when I perform consulting for companies, uh, I, 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 I basically scan the network and I see things like, for example, uh, QA-3-0 uh, dot the name of the company. And I asked, I asked the, uh, you know, the engineers in the company, what is the purpose of this API host? What is the purpose of this microservice? And in many cases, uh, they have at least a few APIs. They don't know what they're used for. Uh, they would tell you, oh, someone like, so, some engineer like, that left the company a few years ago, uh, spin it up and we're just afraid to delete it. And at the same time, this API is exposed to the internet. 
So this is very dangerous, and you can see it many times attackers. The pen tester, I would prefer to, to focus on this uh, APIs first. Because if you have like some you know mobile API or some like payment API, it's more likely that, that uh, the engineers invest resources to, to make them more secure. But if you have this like niche API that nobody knows about, uh, it's much more likely to be vulnerable to different types of attacks. So this is why pen testers many times uh, prefer to focus on those APIs. Yeah, so uh, this this was just a quick uh, brief of the OSP top 10 for APIs. Um, if you want to take a look at more information, you can basically uh, visit uh, the OSP webpage and, uh, and find more information about the OSP top 10 for APIs. And now I'm going to uh, give it to Noop. All right, thank you, Inan. I'm going to start sharing my screen over here. <clears throat> um okay so this is where i'm gonna spend maybe the next uh, five to ten minutes maybe seven to eight minutes walking you through a solution that actually helps in addressing uh, your concerns about around api related exploits right uh, all the way from discovering your apis let's say in your pre-production environments evaluating risk related to your APIs. And then from there, moving into production, that's where you want something that can go in and actively protect these, uh, your applications, your microservices that might be exposing your crown jewels through these APIs. Uh, not just your traditional attacks, but also those business logic attacks that uh, Inan was referring to. And then once an attack happens, how can the solution go about actually um, helping you with incident response, advanced threat hunting, helping you with compliance. Now that you have different compliance mandates, let's say in the financial sector, you have payment services directive to, you have open banking where you're mandated to expose your data to external third parties through, uh, through APIs. How can you go about monitoring those transactions? All of that is something that this product that you see over here, the traceable platform, helps you in addressing. Now, uh, the platform itself, as soon as you deploy the platform, literally within a matter of a few minutes to a couple of hours, and this, by the way, can be deployed on-premise in your data center or in the public cloud or on top of VMs, bare metal servers, Kubernetes clusters, distributed microservices, and even in the very near future on the serverless side of things as well. So as soon as you deploy this platform, literally within a matter of minutes, we'll go in and discover your assets. You, you cannot really protect what you cannot see. So let's figure out what are the assets that you are exposing to the outside world. Um, uh, the, uh, the OWASP API A9, which is basically asset management. Let's help you with that first. Not only do we discover these assets, we'll also tell you how these assets, how these applications, how these microservices are communicating with each other as well. So we'll give you a high level application topology of all the communications that your services are having between each other, regardless of where they are running. They may be on-premise, they may be in the cloud, they may be on Earth, they may be on Juniper, Jupiter or Mars, doesn't really matter, right? Completely infrastructure agnostic. From there, uh, we'll help you in answering question. So the first thing that you should be asking yourself is when you have microservices, the next thing is, what is the composition of this microservice? What are the APIs that it exposes? What are the API endpoints? What are the typical access methods that are used for accessing these API endpoints? All of those questions are automatically answered through the platform without you having to feed the platform, any Swagger definition files, no documentation needed, no human intervention. This, by the way, is a common theme that you'll see slowly sort of emerge through this, uh, through this demonstration. Literally, just simply by deploying our product, uh, we'll be able to discover things that you were not even aware of. So as you can see over here, we'll give you a live catalog that's always kept up to date with your latest software releases, obviously in pre-prod environments, that's where it's the most useful. We'll also give you a high level risk that you inherit 
from your assets, from your APIs, from your API endpoints, those risk related parameters are calculated based on the possibility of a breach against that API endpoint and the impact of that breach. As in, if there is sensitive data that's being exposed through that API endpoint, obviously the, the risk related to that API endpoint is going to be so much more higher. All of those are exposed, including the actual definition of these API endpoints are all exposed for you to consume either through the UI or through backend API. Of course, just like we understand APIs, we also expose APIs, right? So we are able to show you um, all the API definitions, the risk scores related to those API endpoints so that you can very early during your uh, application deployment lifecycle, you can very early discover your assets, evaluate risk that you might be inheriting from those assets. Now that you've figured out what you have in your environment, you can have a much more educated conversation with your auditors. Let's say you're trying to satisfy some compliance mandate because as part of this discovery, we are also able to identify any sensitive data that might be exposed through your API endpoints as well. From there, now we are talking about pre-prod environments, discovery, risk assessment, sensitive data discovery. All of that is fine. But once you start moving your applications, your assets, your microservices um, into production, you need a solution that can help you in actively, proactively protecting your applications, right? That's where our platform can also help you, right? We can go in first and foremost, we have an intimate understanding of the business logic of the application. We use a technology called distributed tracing, which will allow you to literally track and trace user transactions across the entire application. So we are literally giving you and building a baseline of the user journey across the entire application. And then from there, we are able to identify bad actors, threat actors, that might be lurking, that might be hiding in your environment. And those bad actors are identified based on their user ID, regardless of where they are coming from. Even if the user jumps from one machine to the other, uh, jumps across 10 different IP addresses, doesn't matter, we would still be able to detect those users. And then we'll tell you exactly what that user has done in your environment. So we'll build a story of every malicious activity that they have done in a time sequence fashion. Obviously we can detect your traditional attacks, things like SQL injection, cross-site scripting. That's things that we do every day of the week, maybe 10 times on Sunday, big deal. But the, the more sort of difficult, the business logic attacks where like Inan mentioned, right? You have users trying to escalate privileges by inserting brand new API parameters, your mass assignments, or you have instances where you have users trying to access another user's data. These are the types of attacks that cannot be anticipated, that you cannot really identify using patterns, using signatures. You, absolutely, there's no way on earth that you would be able to actually predefine rules to identify these types of attacks. And that's where we are able to, because we have an intimate understanding of the business logic, we are able to identify these types of attacks. Once you that user has been identified, you can take action against these users through the platform itself, variety of actions that are available for you. Um, and so that's sort of the first phase, right? You identified a bad actor, you want to block that user, great, you can go ahead and do that. But then to answer questions around whether this user actually had access to any PII data, what was the collateral damage that this user did in your environment? To help you with that process, we've also built this massive data lake that we are capturing both the normal things that we have observed in the environment and any malicious, any suspicious activities that we have seen. And as part of this data lake, you can go in and do very contextual searches on traces where you can see the exact sequence of activities that the user has done in this environment, how long they spent on each and every API call, how did they enter the application? 
what were the first second third fourth all the exact calls that they made before they eventually broke into the application and stole information from this environment so this was sort of a very quick accelerated view of what this platform does uh in terms of protecting your applications from an api perspective but just to kind of summarize right what this platform this is basically a think about this like a consolidated platform that pretty much follows you through your application deployment life cycle pre prod you can use this for asset discovery risk assessment help you with compliance in production that's where you can use this platform for application protection similar to a wasp similar to a rasp but unlike a wasp unlike a rasp it actually understands api so it can actually protect you against those attacks related to business logic right and then those zero day attacks things that cannot really be anticipated using patterns signatures using predefined rules and then finally in case an attack happens in your environment how do you evaluate the damage for that we have a data lake which can help you with incident response advanced threat hunting um and given that we are capturing everything it can also be used for compliance as well so that's pretty much all i had um we would welcome the opportunity to have a one on one conversation with you as well deep dive into the technology that drives the platform um uh, the traceable platform um happy to answer questions even now as well any questions so if you go to the chat you can find some questions no okay feel free to to ask questions folks yeah i see there is one question from uh, owen if there is a test drive on the web, on the website yeah yeah we have the option of actually allowing you to play around with the platform as well uh, you can you can use a sandbox sort of an environment um to to sort of test drive the platform and yes it works across bare metal servers as well i saw that question as well bare metal servers vms uh containers kubernetes eks aks gke i mean pick your favorite cloud provider uh, uh even to the point of serverless so yes absolutely i think the question that you should always ask yourself is what percentage of your traffic is api driven if it's more than 50% then you should ask the question if you have a tool that actually understands api if the answer to that is no then you should probably be thinking about how you can protect those apis anything else guys yeah ai can is something that we can use of course um it's a combination i mean ai ml these are massively abused terms in today's security world right yes we are definitely using some statistics um to understand business logic we are using a combination of statistics and the right kind of contextual data uh, using distributed tracing All right cool I think I'm um, don't see any other questions so I think we are good Thank you very much guys for joining us Yeah thank you